Here I've got a nice problem which was inspired from a problem on a University of Michigan undergraduate math contest. And the basic idea is to show that the function f of x equals x squared has a nice special property. And that special property is among all functions from real numbers to the interval zero to infinity, including zero, so that's a half open interval, that are surjective. So we can denote a function being surjective or onto by having a double headed arrow here. And then what is this special property that we're looking at? Well, we're looking at a function being as close to two to one as possible. So what does it mean for a function to be two to one? It means if we solve the equation f of x equals y, we get exactly two solutions all of the time. Well, of course, when we pick y from the codomain, notice that f of x equals x squared has this property everywhere except for y equals zero. f of x equals zero has only one solution, x equals zero. Okay, so we're gonna approach this in two parts. Our first part is to show that f of x equals x squared is continuous. And just for practice, we're gonna use the epsilon delta definition of continuity to prove this. And then for our second part, we will assume that we have an onto function f from r to the non-negative real numbers with the property that f of x equals y has exactly two solutions for all possible values of y and show that means that our function is discontinuous. So remember that f of x equals x squared had this property that we're seeking down here everywhere except zero. So it turns out that that zero point, in other words, that vertex of the parabola is very important for allowing this function to be continuous. Because if we've got something like this where every point has two solutions, then we cannot have continuity. Okay, anyway, let's jump into the solution. We'll do part one first. In other words, we will show that f of x is continuous. So we'll start by fixing a real number a, because we haven't said that this is continuous at a certain point, so we read this as being continuous everywhere. And then let's say that we are given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. Let's take delta to be equal to the following number. And you might say, well, how did we get this number? Well, generally we would do scratch work, but since this proof is not really the thrust of the video, we're not gonna go through all of the scratch work with how to get this number. So it's gonna be equal to the minimum of the number one and epsilon over two times the absolute value of a plus one. Throughout our calculation, we'll kind of see where this comes from. Okay, so next we wanna suppose that the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta. And notice that on the one hand, that implies that the absolute value of x minus a is less than one, because delta is definitely less than or equal to one given that delta is the minimum of these two numbers. Okay, but that means that x minus a is between one and negative one. That means x plus a is between two a plus one and two a minus one, just adding two a to all parts of this inequality. Okay, nice. Now from here, we're gonna sneak something in above this and what we'll sneak in above this is two times the absolute value of a plus one. So we know the absolute value of a is most definitely bigger than or equal to a, just by the definition of the absolute value. And then here we're gonna sneak in minus two times the absolute value of a plus one. So I factored a minus one out. That's because a is bigger than or equal to minus the absolute value of a, kind of for the same reason. But now if we read this inequality with only these three parts, we see that implies that the absolute value of x plus a is less than two times the absolute value of a plus one, like that. Okay, and now we're actually ready to kind of finish this thing off now that we've done this calculation. So let's next consider 
the absolute value of x squared minus a squared, which notice that's gonna be the absolute value of f of x minus f of a. Maybe let's point that out here. This is absolute value f of x minus f of a. That's the thing that we want to be less than epsilon to prove continuity here. And recall that our x minus a is less than delta from our assumption up here. Okay, so we can do a difference of squares factoring. This is going to factor into the absolute value of x minus a times the absolute value of x plus a. But by our choice of delta, we know that this absolute value of x minus a will be less than epsilon over this 2 absolute value of a plus 1. So we've got this is less than epsilon over 2 absolute value of a plus 1 times this x plus a, which we just showed was less than 2 times the absolute value of a plus 1. So we've got 2 absolute value of a plus 1. But now notice that denominator cancels with this thing that we got from x plus a, and that leaves us with epsilon. So let's see what we've got here. So we were given an arbitrary epsilon. We used that epsilon to construct a delta. And then we showed that if x minus a was less than delta, then f of x minus f of a was less than epsilon. But that's exactly the condition we need for this function to be continuous. So we finished part one. Okay, now let's move on to part two. Okay, so far we've shown that our function, which takes x and sends it to x squared, is continuous everywhere in its domain, which is the entire real numbers, and on its codomain, in other words, 0 to infinity, it is 2 to 1 except at 0. So that means x squared equals y has exactly two solutions unless y is equal to 0. And now we'll show that point where x being sent to x squared fails to be 2 to 1 is important for providing the ability of continuity. And so let's just reread part 2 before we jump into the solution of part 2. And so if f goes from r on to 0 to infinity has the property that f of x equals y has exactly two solutions for all y. So in other words, it's 2 to 1 for all points y, then f is discontinuous. So it's impossible to be simultaneously continuous and have this 2 to 1 property everywhere. Okay, so let's see how this may go. So we're going to do this by way of contradiction. So we'll suppose that f goes from r to 0 to infinity is continuous and it has the two to one property everywhere. Great. Okay, so now let's get going. So let's solve f of x equals zero. So by the property, this thing that I'm calling the two to one property, this has exactly two solutions. So that means we can take a and b that are real numbers, we might as well take a to be less than b, you know, without loss of generality, such that f of a is equal to f of b is equal to zero. Okay, and now let's notice between a and b, this function can never be zero because we have exactly two solutions. But if it can't be zero, it has to always be positive or always be negative. So that actually breaks this into two cases, which can be solved like essentially the same way. So I'll write those two cases out now. So this means that f of x is bigger than zero for all x on the open interval a to b, or f of x is less than zero for all x on the open interval a to b. So I'm only gonna look at one of these because like I just said, the other one is very similar. We'll look at this condition one. So let's suppose f of x is bigger than zero for all x on the open interval a to b. Okay, then next we're going to apply the extreme value theorem 
to the closed interval AB. So by the extreme value theorem, F achieves a maximum on our closed interval A, B. It also, it also achieves a minimum, but notice by all of the structure we have here, that minimum occurs at A and B and it's equal to zero. Okay, so let's call that maximum maybe capital M and let's say that it occurs at C and that C will be on the open interval A, B. Okay, great. So that means um, we have F of C equals M and F of X is less than or equal to M for all X on our closed interval A, B. And this condition holds because we've got a maximum. Okay, nice. So next up, we'll consider the following equation. So let's consider the equation f of x equals m plus one. Now notice that this guy has to have two solutions. It has to have two solutions because m plus one is still positive and by our two to one condition, it's got two solutions. In this case, we're not actually gonna use both solutions, we'll just use one solution. And so take D such that F of D equals M plus one. And this actually breaks into two cases again. And th those two cases are D is bigger than B or D is less than B. And these two cases operate pretty similarly. So we will just consider the case when D is bigger than B and I'll let you guys check the case when D is less than B. But I will say one thing about it. If D is less than B, that implies that D is also less than A. Why is that? That's because F of X is less than or equal to M, which is definitely less than M plus one on the whole interval A to B. So it's actually impossible to achieve this value M plus one on this interval, which means this solution has to occur off the interval. Like I said, we're going to assume that it occurs to the right of the interval, but in the other case, it would occur to the left of the interval. Okay, so let's maybe clean this up and then we'll finish it off. Okay, so towards proving part two, we have found numbers A and B such that F of A equals F of B equals zero. And then using the extreme value theorem on the closed interval A to B, our function achieves a maximum. We called that maximum M and it occurred at C. And then finally, we found a point D which was bigger than B. This was actually one of the cases where F of D was equal to M plus one. So that's the picture that I've drawn up here. So these are the points that our graph goes through definitely. So notice F of A is zero, F of B is zero, F of C is M, and then F of D is M plus one. Furthermore, if we were to draw the graph on the interval A to B, the graph is always gonna be below M. Okay, so let's maybe sketch this graph out. So all we know that it is continuous. We don't know if it's smooth or anything like that. It's just continuous, which means we can draw it without picking up the chalk. So I'm just gonna draw something that's kind of jagged for the sake of argument. So notice it's gotta go like this, it's gotta go like this, and then it has to go like that. But that tells us that there's a problem because if we put a horizontal line here, that horizontal line is forced to go through three points on the graph, meaning that we've got three solutions to a certain equation instead of two as we assumed right here. So now we just have to write that down maybe carefully. So let's consider the equation given by f of x equals, well, it needs to be some y value that is between zero and m. It doesn't really matter what it is. 
as long as it's between zero and and m. So let's say equals y naught, where y naught is on the open interval zero to m. You could maybe take a nice value if you wanted to, but I'll just call it y naught. Okay. So how do we know that there's a solution between A and C? Well, we know that by the intermediate value theorem. So by the intermediate value theorem, there exists, and I'm gonna break this down into three different points. So there exists some point which I'll call X naught, and that point is on the interval A to C, such that f of x naught is equal to y naught. So like I said, that's by the intermediate value theorem because f of a is less than f of c and y naught is between those two values. Okay, so now let's do that again, but on the interval c to b. So there exists something I'll call x1 on the interval c to b such that f of x1 is equal to y naught for the same reason with the intermediate value theorem. And then next, we can do the same thing on the interval b to d. So we'll say x2 is on the interval b to d, such that f of x2 is equal to y naught. And now we see that it's not important that we had m plus 1 here. We just really needed some value of y bigger than m to force that solution to happen outside of this interval a to b by our extreme value theorem thing. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. So this interval a, c, c, b, and b, d, those are disjoint. So that means that x naught is not equal to x1 x naught is not equal to x2, and x1 is also not equal to x2. But their functional value is the same, so that means the equation f of x equals y naught has at least three solutions. But that's a contradiction. It contradicted this assumption over here that it has exactly two solutions. So what did we contradict? Well, if you remember at the beginning, we assumed that we had a continuous function satisfying this condition, which means in fact, we do not have a continuous function satisfying this condition, which means any function satisfying this condition must be discontinuous. And that's a good place to stop.